Hi guys, how's it going? My name is Joe Terrell and welcome to the Undercut, the GP blog podcast. I am back after my own summer break and Mercedes have finally arrived as well. Normal service was resumed in Russia. As usual, I'm joined by my experts to recap all the action from Sochi. We'll look forward to Suzuka and the Japanese Grand Prix. And we'll have another heated debate in the hot take section. This is the 2019 season, episode 7. So guys, it's good to be back in my hot seat. How have you been, lads, without me? I've been well, thank you, Joe. Yeah, it's good to be back in the seat and uh, not presenting for once. Well, Formula One has been back. We enjoyed the Russian Grand Prix? For a Russian Grand Prix, yeah, it wasn't so bad. We uh, slated it a bit last week, but um, it wasn't so bad this time. Mm, Yeah, I mean, in the end, I think uh, Adam and Bobby, who's not with us today, they had both predicted Mercedes victories. I I tried to forced them into making a different prediction but i guess they were right in the end but well, yeah as adam said they were almost, russian grand prix was they were almost architects of their own downfall ferrari really yeah well, well vettel was vettel was yeah i think they still would have won the race without vettel's um mechanical problems so it was just a bit weird really that whole um first stint where they were trying to get leclerc in front of vettel and um i think they were right to do it in the pit stop phase but I think it was just a lot of hot air over nothing, really, and um, they should have just kept quiet over the radio and waited for the pits and done the done the switch around there. Well, we'll have more f- on our Russia review later on in the episode, but we're going to start with the news. So, one massive bit of news that we had earlier in the week, the McLaren-Mercedes deal. McLaren moving back to a Mercedes power unit. Yeah, what a waste of six years, hey? Um, three years with Honda, three years with Renault, going back to Mercedes, who... Uh, they had quite a lot of success, McLaren and Mercedes, from the mid '90s to the mid 2010s. A good, solid period. Won a only one drivers' title, I think. Oh, three, because Hakkinen won two. Yeah, won three drivers' titles together. McLaren have really come back in. Well, this season really. Last season wasn't so great towards the back end, and um, hopefully they can continue that resurgence. Resurgence. Yeah, that's the word I'm looking for. That uh, exponential rise that they've been on recently, and and get back to where they should be, or not where they should be, where they have been previously. I think it's interesting from a Mercedes point of view that Toto Wolff said when the partnership was announced that they're looking forward to McLaren taking the fight to the top teams, which include themselves. So for them to partner up with McLaren and potentially creating another title rival in McLaren, because they'll know more than anyone how lethal their partnership can be. uh, I think it's interesting that Mercedes have basically created another rival for themselves here. But I am a tiny bit scared that having a new engine partner again can maybe set them back because obviously maybe it won't fit properly in the car and you have all those kind of issues. I, Once you y- settle in with one, then you change again. It causes, you reset back to the start. Yeah, you, sometimes the, the engine just doesn't fit in the chassis at all. We've, we've seen it sometimes and I just hope that McLaren, now that they've finally gotten the ball rolling again after having struggled for so many years, I hope this doesn't uh, set, set them back again, but it should be a very exciting partnership. Part of the deal sees Lando Norris become part of the part of Mercedes Driver Academy. Yeah, they um they're part Lando Norris is now part of uh, Mercedes's driver program, I believe. So he I'm not quite sure what all the details are. It's a bit vague um what we know at the moment, but it seems like he's got a deal with Mercedes where he's kind of like what well, George Russell is right now so he's uh, I guess you could say out on work experience uh, um, at McLaren like George Russell is at Williams and potentially could be after you know Mercedes lost Esteban Ocon to Renault he's Ocon's direct replacement perhaps I'm not so sure yeah it's funny that they basically just cut another driver to stand in line for a Mercedes seat potentially they already have Ocon they already have George Russell who are both amazing talents and they bo- they're both basically waiting their turn for a Mercedes ride, and maybe Lando Norris gets added to the list now. Yeah, but at, on the same page, maybe McLaren gets turned into like a Mercedes youth team, although I don't think they'll want to break up the I partnership. I can't see that. I can't see a team so big as McLaren and historic as McLaren uh, accepting being anyone's youth team. Mm. Yeah, and also, obviously, they have this amazing combination of Sainz and Norris right now. 
Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think they'll want to break it up, but you never know. You'd, Mercedes love a team order. You never know. At the end, of, at the end of next year, Mercedes might get uh, bored of Bottas and get rid of him, and <laughs> maybe they don't think Russell's ready or whatever, and they bring in Norris. Who knows? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of um, uncertainties around it. Mm -hmm. Well, given how fast McLaren have been this season with a Renault engine, I'm a little scared to think what they could be with a Mercedes engine, but. We'll have to wait and see, and that deal runs until 2024, so should be an interesting one. Um, and more big news regarding constructors. A new team, Campos Racing. Hmm. Yeah, Campos Racing, a Spanish team. Uh, his, when, when Hispania were in Formula 1, that, that was basically under the same flag. Obviously not the best constructor we've ever seen this not decade. Not quite. But yeah, Campos are a Spanish team. Uh, they have basically the same livery as McLaren right now. They've been quite successful in Formula E. I think they won the initial season, 2014-15, yep. yeah. with Nelson Piquet Jr. They've won GP2 championships. They won Formula 3 championships. So they do have some pedigree. I don't know how successful they'll be in F1 and whose engine they'll drive with and all of that. Maybe Renault have another customer mm, now. I think it was peculiar how in their uh, press release... They mentioned um, two drivers that they want to sign up for 2021. They mm. mentioned Pascal Verlein and yeah. uh, Spanish driver Alex Palau. Is that how you say it in yeah. Spanish? Yeah. Um, I thought that was a little bit weird. Like, how can you decide which drivers you want to sign up? You never know. There might be a great driver suddenly available mm. in 2021, such as Hulkenberg this season. I think they'll definitely want one Spanish one because they do... Fernando Alonso. Yeah, return. I was going to say, Fernando Alonso. There you go. <laughs> Well, at that point, he'll be like 40 or something, won't he? He won't care. He'll keep linking himself with suits. <laughs> yeah. But they will definitely want to have at least one Spanish driver. And if that's Palau, you know, he's not the most household name to uh, say it lightly. But um, I just love the fact that, that a Spanish team is coming back, honestly. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just happy with that point, period. Well, more teams. Boris Rottenberg, the Russia's 69th wealthiest man, has said he wants nice. to enter a team as well yeah i um read about this earlier he's um he already backs uh smp racing that's sorotkin's uh, Sorotkin Sorotkin yeah. sponsors and had to do with uh vitaly petrov yeah and they are in i think they've done limon a couple times and a few um i won't say WEC because it annoys <laughs> nick a few world endurance championship races um so potentially two new teams for 2021 bring the grid back up to 24 drivers which would be very very interesting. I think that'd be a good number. Well, we don't know. I'm sad to say this, but we don't know what will happen to Williams by that time. Yeah. It's not, it's not looking, looking good for them, is it? No. Not at all, no. Having um, to pit, having to pull over Kibitza to save parts. Yeah, uh, hopefully Williams can get over this real huge slump. I don't think we've seen a team struggle as much as Williams this year since the days of HRT. You know, they've they really have been that bad, and uh, we just got to hope that they get through it. Hopefully, they will find some sponsorship somewhere. Maybe Latifi comes into that team next year with a lot of money, and they stay alive that way. Who knows? But a, a grid without Williams would be a real sad shame to see for me. Definitely. Right, we'll move on to Russia now. So last time out in Sochi, it was actually quite a good race for Russia's standards, but... Vettel went rogue, Mercedes were able to take advantage of it. Normal service was resumed, their first 1-2 since Silverstone. And as we said just now, Williams had to pull over Kibitza to save parts for the Japanese Grand Prix. Adam, did we enjoy the race? I did enjoy the race, actually. I wasn't expecting to enjoy the race. But in the end, it, it actually was... It surprised me uh, in some ways. I think I didn't enjoy much of the on-track battles because there weren't many. But the whole Ferrari strategy, the whole uh, Mercedes pitting under the VSC to um, gain loads of time on Leclerc and overtake him, was uh, it was intriguing rather than exciting for me. I think the whole Leclerc team radio thing was very interesting. More than exciting, it was very interesting because I, I, I kind of got where he was coming from, Leclerc, in the sense that uh, he would have to prefer pit strategy after Singapore, etc. But at the same time... He was also, well, I think Crybaby is maybe a bit extreme, but he was complaining a little bit because Vettel was genuinely just setting fastest laps every lap. And well, it was like when you, he was just, when they, they asked him to make the switch, he was like three seconds back or something. Yeah, and Vettel was literally just, if he wants to switch, you'll have to yeah. catch me. Which, which I, I, thought, I, I thought was fair enough. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they, they just want, just race, you know? Just 
I don't know what what Leclerc's problem was. If you want to catch him, if if you want to switch around, just catch him up. And eventually Ferrari did quite smartly, I think, leave Vettel out for an extra couple laps, so it would happen naturally. But at the same time, why would you do that? You just kind of shoot yourself in the foot by putting your quickest driver on the day at a disadvantage like yeah, that. Yeah, I thought the Ferrari whole agreement from the start of the race was really peculiar, how they um, they told Charles Leclerc to give Vettel the slipstream, which is fair enough, hmm. get Vettel ahead of Lewis Hamilton, but don't let him get past, otherwise you're just purely disadvantaging one of your drivers who who is on pole position, so he's at that point, proved that he should be the quickest in the race. I know it didn't turn out that way, but it just seemed a, a weird strategy for me. They, I think they should have not said anything. Maybe Leclerc, give Vettel slipstream for a little while and then do what you want. But just for Leclerc to sit there like a sitting duck into turn two was just a bit weird for me. I, d- I don't really understand what they were trying to achieve. It, it was almost too... The last three races were too good to be true, wasn't it? They'd been perfect. Yeah, they are trying too hard. Three, three and then four, they just pushed their luck. And it backfired eventually. But Mercedes took full advantage and fair play to them. They were, I thought, well, classic Mercedes, really. Ruthless. I, th- I thought that there was, every time this happens, there a, a debate gets sparked that it should be, should it be illegal to pit under virtual safety car? Because you get, it's such an advantage. Um, well, at the same time, Vettel did the same thing to Hamilton in Australia last year. Yeah. But you just basically get gifted like what 10 seconds or something when you I think pits. it's more I think it's about 15 yeah so it it's it's a it's a free basically a free overtake for mercedes and like you said they were ruthless and bottas i think defended brilliantly from leclerc oh, yeah. um basically saving up all his ers for the straights and just not letting him pass there and then just keeping his elbows out in the corners but yeah i i do think that there, there's something to that argument of making it illegal to pit under virtual yeah, safety car. The thing with the virtual safety car is it's supposed to neutralize the race exactly, while it really doesn't. something's cleared up. And mm. it just gives a a huge advantage to someone who's not pitted or who's coming around to the pit lane. Yeah. And that is not neutralizing the race. It's like when you it's like when a yellow flag comes out and you you have to slow down and not overtake. It's basically I don't know, can you describe it as a whole track yellow flag mm, in yeah, a way? Sort so of. it should do the same thing as a yellow flag would do in, in one sector. And it's, I don't know, you know, at the same time, it also gave, in China last year, it gave Ricar- Ricciardo that victory and it does provide some good racing and, and at times, but it's just, I don't know, unfair is maybe not the word, but it, it just changes it's the unlucky. whole it just didn't changes the whole dynamic of the race and ferrari couldn't do anything about it they just got it's extremely unlucky and you know further back down the grid it, it hulkenberg got super unlucky and he only finished 10th um in the end uh it's i don't know i think there's definitely something to be talked about maybe for 2021 that or maybe even for next mm. season that something should be done about i think we were robbed a little bit of a really exciting race because hamilton and bottas going long on those medium tires leclerc had already pitted and hamilton was sort of catching could hamilton catch up in the in the final few laps like we saw in uh belgium and italy where we Mm. had such a great battles between leclerc hamilton and then bottas later on at monza yeah hamilton attacking someone is always so exciting exciting to watch you know what happened to verstappen in hungary what happens to leclerc really hunted him down it's you know that's that's what we're here for and it would basically yeah we it it just got taken away from us because of that virtual safety car but you know you can't blame mercedes obviously from doing it take the win when it's there for sure yeah Yeah. and they basically just that that is what mercedes are best at is being there to take advantage of when everyone else is slipping up yeah and they just like squish the championship now it's there it's done absolutely if it wasn't done before it's if ferrari would have taken that one too um you know you could talk yourself into whatever it probably wouldn't have happened anyway but you yeah. could have you know talked you could have semi believed it. it yeah but now there's just absolutely no way no no way anymore we mentioned williams just now pulling over kibitza after russell crashed after going all season without any retirements how many have they had now three in three and two races yeah it is really tough times <laughs> for williams oh yeah it's sad um like i said before i hope they get some money come in they're going to lose Kubica's, uh Polish sponsorship as well at the end of this year. And 
Well, they'll get the hashtag Latifi money. That's true. They'll get that um, sweet Canadian money <laughs> coming those in. Canadian dollars. Uh, maybe Mercedes can pay him a bit more to have George Russell. But I don't know. I don't know. Um, yeah, we saw their uh, finances a little while ago. I can't remember any of the numbers now, but they didn't look good. I think they were down about 35% on on last year or something. They lost the Martini Yeah, deal, lost the Martini obviously. deal. That was lost a massive... the Stroll, lost... Uh, Sirotkin. Yeah, and I think their money. I think their Rexona deal was up it was up yeah. as well, and that's obviously gonna impact them. And obviously, it's hard to get sponsors if you're not competing. Yeah. So yeah. The... Uh, how much TV time do Williams get? Mm. No, yeah, they if... should probably ask George Russell to crash into the wall <laughs> to get more sponsorship because that's the only way they're going to get on the telly. Well, speaking of that crash, by the way, it was very weird because yeah. I think I think he lost the brakes and he also lost steering. As, wasn't it as soon as the track went green? Yeah, I think it was. Maybe it was even under the virtual really? safety car. And you can see him like staring and nothing was happening. And mm. his left front wheel was just uh, not moving. Uh, and I think there was something up with like his, his steering column or something like that. And that was the first actual like mechanical DNF yeah. they've had all season, which I guess is fair play to them. But then to see them pulling over Kubica basically, that, yeah, as a driver, that probably is that probably hurts the lowest yeah. low you can have and yeah that must be such such a blow for Kibitza we'll move on to some of the names that didn't get a mention in our race review some of the winners and losers Adam I'll start with you who are you going with this week as your winner from Russia uh, I'm gonna mention uh, Alex Alban actually um, after qualifying you wouldn't have said that he was a winner but after the race uh, yeah for sure he came from the pit lane all the way up to P5, his uh, equaled his best uh, finish in Formula One. I think he got fifth in Belgium, Belgium. as well. And um, I think, yeah, qualifying was not good. It wasn't a good way to to bow out of Q1 with that crash. It wasn't an intelligent thing to, obviously not intelligent, but it wasn't a clever thing to do, was it? Um, to spin off at turn 13. But he seems to be really, really good at these recovery drives. Yeah. He did it in uh, Belgium. He had loads of Grid penalties. And then in China earlier in the season yes, when he, he was at Toro Rosso. Yes, he went from 20th to 10th. And now Start he's from gone pits, from the pits, and... the pits to P5. Oh, yeah, yeah. he binned it in China, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, During free practice three or something. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, I remember it, yeah. That was a really big crash, wasn't it? I don't remember it. It reminded me of when uh, Giovinazzi did the same for Sauber in oh, 2017. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it's yeah, some massive shunts uh, for Alban that time. But yeah. Impressive drive by him. Yeah, obviously he he knows how to overtake on a difficult track. I think he got he lucky confident. with the safety car as well. He looks relatively confident, more than Gasly anyway. Yeah. And uh, yeah, fair play to him. I'd like to see him put a full weekend together though, sooner rather than he's later. Never, he's not been able to with first race. He had the engine yeah. change, and he's not been he's not had that full weekend. So but yeah. I'd I'd like to see him. He doesn't have to beat a Mercedes or. A, a Ferrari. He just needs to be amongst in it. a battle with them. Yeah. And mm. and if he finishes, um, if he finishes fifth, but he's two seconds behind Valtteri Bottas, you know, I think that's a success considering it's his debut season, and he's you know what, what's he done now? Sixteen Formula One races. You know, that's not a lot, is it, to be uh, battling at the front? So, yeah, I'd like to see him challenge a little bit more. But yeah, he. I mean, he's doing fantastic anyway. We can't take anything away from him. It looks, if, if unless there's someone else comes along, it looks like he will be in that Red Bull seat next season as well. Yeah, I think he will be. I think he's shown more than Gasly. And he's young, he's talented. Can he's... you imagine him taking that back? <laughs> imagine Gasly. taking Gasly. Just oh run it back. <laughs> yeah. No, no he'll be in that seat next year. I'm, I'm yeah, that... 95% sure. <laughs> <laughs> Got to leave a little bit in there in case he bins it in every race. <laughs> yeah. Right, Nick, who is your big winner from the weekend? I am going to go for Sergio Perez. Mm, yeah, very good race. For a finished seventh. I said, I think it was just after the summer break, I said to Adam, uh, how is like Sergio Perez, the form he's in, he'll be lucky to have a seat next season, and even though he would have a seat. Like he didn't just on the form he was in, and since the summer break, he's pulled out some unreal results. I mean, he had that DNF in uh, Singapore, didn't he? He had a mechanical. Yeah, but apart thing. from that, he's been sixth, seventh, and sixth. Yeah, in in Monza, he obviously or he held off for Stappen in Monza. Mm. Really good defending, um, and now P seven. Um, very yeah, I, I don't know. 
running out of superlatives sometimes for uh, for Sergio Perez is another amazing drive from him, and he is um, quite comfortably beating Lance Stroll in within the team, uh, which should give him plenty of confidence. Um, but when he's driving like this, you know, it, it it's so good to watch. And he started eleventh, finished seventh. I don't know, just a just a very very good weekend again from Perez, and he. Sh- I'd back him to do just as well in Japan, really, next week. Yeah, Perez is on absolute fire, but there are some drivers who are in no form whatsoever. Adam, who is your loser this week? So for my loser, I'm going to go with Alfa Romeo. Alfa, uh, Kimi and Antonio. Yeah, not the best race for them. Uh, Raikkonen finished in P13 and Giovinazzi Fantastic just start behind him. Yeah, <laughs> the the um, jump start jump start was not so great. Giovinazzi what back in. What punishment did he get for that? P fifteen. He got a drive through. Is that a drive through? I think it's a drive through. Looking over at our producer, he gives us a thumbs up. It is a drive through. It, it is, is a drive through. Yep. Um. So yeah, and and then Giovinazzi at turn one kind of was the meat in a Grosjean and Daniel Ricciardo <laughs> sandwich. Oh, yeah. uh, both drivers going over his front wheels that was a bit unlucky on his part uh, i mean he seemed to just continue was that turn one i think it was uh, turn oh, it was three turn, or four yeah well one of the first corners anyway four i think four after the long left hander yeah yeah um so no points for alfa romeo again again yeah it's not not the first time that's happened uh very recently anyway and in the constructors it's looking a little bit bleak for them now they've lost um contact with Torosa and racing point they're down in eighth 35 points at 17 to Racing Point in 7th, which is, in in that midfield battle, is quite a lot. They're going to need a very good performance towards the end of the season if they want to get anywhere above 8th. Uh, and they're only 7 points ahead of Haas. Uh, and Kevin Magnussen, we could have mentioned as a winner, mm. uh, coming home ninth. You know, maybe they're back on the point-scoring trail, who knows? Two so, points. Yeah, Alpha look a bit stuck in 8th right now. Mm. Right, Nick. Adam went with Alfa Romeo. Who are you going with as your loser? Who took the L? Max Verstappen. Or maybe actually more Red Bull than Max Verstappen because I really think like the stories are really starting to bubble up now that Verstappen is really looking at other teams beyond the 2020 season. His contract is running until the end of next season. And um, Red Bull keeps saying, we're going to we're gonna pull next to Ferrari and, and Mercedes. We're going to really be as competitive as they are and they're just nowhere near after the safety car for Stappen was obviously right behind the top three and he just couldn't do anything and uh, obviously you know with Max he's gonna get the absolute if he can take it take he's over, gonna take the he's gonna ax, do it. absolute maximum from that car mm. every single time and he just couldn't get anywhere near Leclerc um, and you know we've heard this heard these comments from his dad Jos yeah. uh, saying you know he's gonna look at other teams uh, we've heard, um, I don't know how much stock you should take into this, but, you know, we've heard Rosberg saying as well, you know, he should leave Red Bull and stuff. And they Our do... favourite YouTuber, Nico. <laughs> they meet... They, I think they really need a massive result in Japan, uh, like a statement result and really good end of the season to sway Max in their direction because if they lose him, that could really take them down this downwards, downward spiral. Yeah, because... That it's not like they've got another star driver waiting, is there? No. So, I mean... Well, they got rid of Dan Tictum. <laughs> yeah. And they've got Albon and whatever, but like there's no, award. like... Yeah. You know, there's nothing There's really... no massive, you know, next superstar, like we were talking about Max, um, how long ago? Five, Five six years ago. Years ago? 2014. Yeah. Is his fifth season now? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the talks really started going. He's only 22. He's only 22. Happy birthday, by the way, Max. <laughs> uh, yeah, the talks about Verstappen started going in 2014 when he won that Formula 3 race when he was 16. But yeah, Red Bull, Helmut Marko promised five race victories this year. We, uh, uh, they've got to win, how many races are left? Got, Six. Is there's, it? Five, five, there's five. five, there's red, five yeah. So they have to win three of the next five, basically. Not happening, is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, they do love Mexico, but yeah. And I thought they'd, I'd thought they'd done well to win two at this stage because... Yeah, but when you've uh, got a driver like Max Verstappen, you have to please him you have to do something to keep hold of him yeah you have to please him because he is not going to wait around forever formula one is not about it's not about loyalty it's not about you know being nice to the whoever helped you get there if if you know Haas had a driving program and they got the new b12 
big youngster come through, he's not going to stay with him his entire career. He's going to move on. Like, you know, George Russell is going to move on from Williams. Lando Norris is going to move on from McLaren. It's just the evolution of Formula One. Is he? Is, is Norris moving on? Well, no, because they're going to be a world-beating team in three or four years. So, <laughs> <laughs> I hope. <laughs> well, I'm going to give a special mention to my big loser this week, which is Cyril Irritable and Renault. Because <laughs> Cyril beats Bull. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> because he is... I don't, I've really gone off him in the last few weeks. I think two weeks ago he said, Renault have a better overall clock car than McLaren. McLaren's revival is purely down to Renault. And in the two races, since he said that... I think they've scored two points. They've scored two points. So and you, McLaren have finished above them on both occasions. So you're giving it to him because you don't like him, basically. It's yeah, just basically. A personal thing. Basically, yeah. <laughs> but no, personal. their results Harsh. haven't been good enough. Anyway, enough about Cyril. Um, we'll, old Cyril. We'll move He's on. trying. <laughs> He's trying his best. Joe Cyril. <laughs> <laughs> We'll move on to our Japan preview now. Nick, you're going to talk us through the circuit layout. What can we expect from the Suzuka circuit? From the circuit itself? Well, this is one of those circuits that the drivers just absolutely love. It's a really like a racer circuit. It's not um, the widest track. It is very, it's quite difficult to overtake, but um, it... Monza does, uh, Monza. Suzuka does have a bit of everything. You obviously have the, the, the famous corner, um, but overall, I think... It's um, it's one of those tracks that just tends to. Although I'm, now I'm thinking of recent races, they haven't been that good, have they? But I was gonna say it tends to give a good race, but maybe that's me thinking more historically than uh, yeah. in recent years. Well, they haven't done so well recently, but the track itself is a is a thing of beauty. The, yeah. the spoon corner, one thirty R, the S's in the first sector. Mm. It's a stunning track, but the races perhaps haven't been what we would want them to be. I mean, looking back in at the past, we had all the Senna and Prost. Um, <laughs> in eighteen ninety nine. What, what, what should we call that? Uh, Title deciders. Activities, yeah. yeah. And not quite been so good recently, but it's still, for me, uh, a staple of the Formula One calendar. Yeah. One of my favourite tracks. Definitely, same here. Well, last season, it was a familiar scenario. Mercedes won two and Max Verstappen on the podium. And Sebastian Vettel was complaining over the radio about a Max Verstappen overtake and his world championship hopes were slowly fading away but enough about last season because it was a pretty forgettable race what do we expect from this season as i just said about red bull i i expect them to go all guns blazing pretty much this grand prix suzuka is a track originally built by honda honda's headquarters are next to suzuka this is this is basically like their time to shine Last season, they obviously had uh, Hartley and Gasly qualifying P6 and P7 for with Honda engines. That was like a landmark result for them. And um, they're quite proud, I think. And they'll really, really, really want to do well this race. I genuinely expect Red Bull. This is one of the races where I really expect them to either win or get one or two drivers. Do you think they the can win, realistically? I know they've got a new engine for this race. Yeah, and as I said, I think they'll literally just throw everything they have at this race because they need to win at home. I I really think they do. Um, So I'm expecting really big things from Red Bull. And uh, apart from that, Ferrari do seem to have the better overall package than Mercedes. Obviously, it's you can't predict what will happen during the race. You can't predict Vettel suddenly having an MGU failing. And you can't predict the safe the virtual no, safety no, car stuff no but ferrari should be i'm ex- i'm basically expecting ferrari and red bull to be the the top dogs in this one give us your podium put me down for uh max verstappen p1 um Ooh, brave and who's gonna be p2 vettel or leclerc give me a vettel p2 leclerc p3 vettel at this point i think is uh the better race driver than uh, in races i mean than leclerc I think he just has that bit more of experience, a bit more mm-hmm. of racecraft. I, I mean, that start, his starts are so good. Yeah. I think that's the thing about Vettel that they uh, always have been, really. Yeah, that's it. And obviously, you don't really have a long run into the first corner in in Japan, but I'm expecting that, like a Max to win, maybe. I mean, maybe that's a bit optimistic of me and a bit biased. And yeah, I, think I have my orange glasses I, on. I want to see Max get a good result. I'd love to see him up on the podium for Honda, for Red Bull, for him. 
personally as well and pointing at that Honda yeah, logo that would mean so much to them which is why it was so embarrassing when uh, was it was a Suzuka when Alonso shouted GP2 engine over yeah. the radio however I just don't think they new engine or what home advantage or what I'm not sure they're going to have enough to get a win I'm buying into no. your narrative I'm going to I'm going to go with a um, I'm going to go with a Ferrari win I think uh, Charles Leclerc will get back on top and he'll be joined on the podium by I think Lewis will get on there in P2 and let's let's give Max a P3 a podium appearance That's for nice Honda it is generous of me I well know. I I think uh, do we care about you're your both opinion? deluded it's going to be a Mercedes 1-2 and Alex Albon is going to be P3 after okay. Max Verstappen this is not crashes happen, out it? no it's not going to happen that's why you're the presenter and we're the pundits Max Max and Seb will collide on lap 27 hmm. right. and Charles Leclerc will come forth fourth nice alright Alban right. P3 put your money on it okay <laughs> I actually will do now if you want me to if you want me yeah. to lose money Right, it's time for that part of the show where everything gets a bit tense in here and everybody gets focused for the hot take section. Adam, you're going to go first this week. The theme is Helmet Marco said Vettel has no future at Ferrari. This was after he ignored team orders. Mm. Yeah. Adam, you'll be given 30 seconds to tell me why Sebastian Vettel has no future at Ferrari, why he's done. You'll hear this sound when the time is up. Stop it. And then at the end, I'll pick a winner and we'll top all the total up at the end of the season and we'll see who wins. So you're going to, Adam, you're going to tell me that Sebastian Vettel is done at Ferrari. Your time starts now. Okay, Sebastian Vettel is 32 years old. Charles Leclerc is a decade younger than him. Vettel's not getting any younger. He has, yeah, he's had a stellar career, but I think it's time now that they really prefer Leclerc. You know, ignoring team orders is just, you know, he's done it before. He's not going to, you know, be a team player. He never has been a team player, really. And I think Ferrari have got to make a stand. They've got a lot of young drivers coming through. They should prioritise Leclerc. Vettel is done out here. Bring someone young in. Fresh and blood. that's your time. Stop no it. more. Please and stop. win some titles. Well, that bit won't be included, and you may be punished for that. But, Nick, you're going to tell me why Sebastian Vettel still has a future at Ferrari. Can he regain those glory days? Your time starts now. Well, Adam mentioned his old age between brackets. Can I remind you of Nigel Mansell winning his championship when he was, what, 40 years old, 39 years old? Can I uh, remind you of um, Fangio, who won his at like 46 years old? He has so much life in, left in him. We saw it in Singapore. The man has so much race craft. He's so clever. And we saw again in Russia, his starts are stellar. When he's on form, when he gets it going, when those juices are flowing with Sebastian Vettel, he is a sensational driver. And that's it. Stop it. Four-time four no! championship winner. We can't have that. That won't be included. Can I just say that Fangio winning at 46, it was the 1950s. <laughs> so yeah, like top speed was like 20. Oh, <laughs> well, come on. If, if you win at that age, you win at that age. It goes down in the record well, books. Well, Age is just a number, Joe Tyrrell. <laughs> Don't try and convince him after you've done. You f you'll finish your 30 seconds. Well, mm. given that the Singapore argument makes a lot of sense. It does. And <sighs> the Fangio argument especially. Uh, it makes no sense. <laughs> it was 60 years ago. I have so? to give it to Nick this week. Oh, that's, that's corrupt. I have to. That's corrupt. Thank I feel you. a bit robbed, to be honest. Thank you. Charles Leclerc is 22, but Hamilton is what? Yeah, Sorry. but Hamilton's a freak. Hamilton's even older. Hamilton's 34. a freak. 34. He only has one more title than Vettel. Yeah, yeah, no, but Vettel won them in ages ago. Ages. He won a title for six in years. In the 50s. <laughs> <laughs> it might as well be. I, I could, so have, actually, I could have just said Hamilton is older than Vettel and he's just like banging out these championships still. <laughs> that would have won the argument as well. Well, uh, better luck next time, Adam. Well, I'll tell you who's finished, Adam. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Bring back Bobby. <laughs> we'll see next time. I'll, I'm coming back. All Come guns on, blazing for you. Three. It's 4-3 to Nick in the championship standings. Five we'll races to go. Five to go, and then we might even chuck it in in our end of season awards. Mm. Time for some of the crowd questions now. Questions from the fans, the GP blog fans. Right, so sadly he's not with us today, but I've got a question from Bobby Vincent. Bobby wants to know, could you see Carlos Sainz at a top team in a few years? Mm, yeah, I was discussing this with Bobby uh, one time. He's obviously on our team at GP Blog, but um, I do think that Science has the 
the pace, the pedigree in terms of racecraft and stuff to to be at a top team. But it's all about uh, opportunity. You know, you you can have a scenario like Mercedes where suddenly a seat is available, like they had when Rosberg uh, retired out of out of the blue. And like that, he could get a seat at a top three team. But at the same time, you know, they always want their own drivers. Uh, they they want it to be one of their own, basically. Um, so, in in that regard, it might be difficult for him. But you know, maybe maybe McLaren can be. Maybe he doesn't need to move. Yeah, maybe maybe he can lead McLaren to the promised land. Oh yes, please. Carlos, world champion, 2021. Well, I'm not sure about that one. <laughs> well, we'll have to wait and see for a few years on this one. But Matt Gretton has on Twitter said, Albon's been at Red Bull for a few races now. How's he doing? Do you think he's been doing better than Gasly? I think we think he's Yeah, we, t- we touched on this briefly earlier, didn't we? I, um, I do think he's doing better than Gasly. I think Gasly made more mistakes. He got stuck in the midfield more often. He... Um, got stuck and then couldn't get out. Yeah, he? he just he what didn't seem like he was comfortable or brave enough in there, whereas Albon is just, you know, balls to it. If he's there, I'm going to overtake him. I don't care where. I'm going to get past him, like with the move on. Um, was it Ricciardo? I mean, Sainz in, in uh, Monza. No, I mean Ricciardo in the middle sector in Belgium. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Around the outside. Yeah, um, um, obviously what, I, what I'm what i referencing to is his battle with Sainz in Italy, yeah. where he eventually got the penalty. But um, I do think that Gasly really lacked uh confidence or bravery as mm. you said to literally just to send one down the inside yeah. just like go for it and see what happens um i remember his first obviously it was his first race but in australia he just didn't got come home eighth he can't came home 11th oh he could, yes he, he got did didn't he yeah he got eighth was it in in um Bahrain. Bahrain. Yeah. yeah yeah but he was i remember in australia he like time and time again he pulled out of the slipstream as if he's going to do it and then he just didn't because I don't know he just lacked he, I don't know he uh, he just didn't want to do it and especially when you're diving for a top team you need to carve through the midfield and uh, that is something that album I think he maybe some of his he moves he knows how to do it some of his moves were maybe a bit too optimistic but I think turning that down is easier than turning it up yeah for sure well Brad Tomshaw is back and he wants to know, does pineapple belong on pizza? No. Yes. Adam says no. Adam, why no? If you're going to say fruit doesn't belong on pizza, you can go away. Well, I, I like a nice, fresh, freshly cut bit of pineapple as much as the next guy. Mm. But I do enjoy a bit of pineapple. Yeah, pineapple. Ma- making it warm and like... Ugh. Nah, warm pineapple is just not the one for me. Warm fruits is just... Unless you've got a lovely apple pie with custard... Warm fruits is just not the one for me. And to put it in a pizza, and it just spoils your entire pizza. Right, Nick. Now tell me why it does belong on pizza. It it just gives that little bit of freshness, that bit of je ne sais quoi, you know? That, <laughs> it's uh, soggy. It's not fresh. It's soggy. It's not soggy. Maybe you, you've been... Maybe I've had bad pineapple pizzas my entire life. You're calling it the soggy autodrum. I am calling it the soggy <laughs> autodrum. <laughs> and no. it produces terrible pizzas like terrible races. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, obviously, um, I no, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna defend pineapple pizzas because it's, it's like a little bit of a, a surprise, you know. You bite into a pizza and you, you, you get your, your, your cheese, your tomato. I, I don't want to be surprised. You just get that bit of, <laughs> bit of fruit, that bit of exotic I freshness. I want to know what I'm eating. Ah, oh, come on. But a zest. It's just a bit of, you know, wow. It's like, the oh, wow factor. I'm going to put rat poison in my pizza so when I bite <laughs> into it, I'm surprised. Yeah, that, you know that, what that, I mean? Very comparable, yeah. Thank you for, thank you for that you see, one, you Brad. See, you, you see what I'm what arguing with here. <laughs> Look what you've done, Brad. You've, you've, oh, how, is it just four th- how is it just four three? You see the, the, <laughs> the arguments this man brings. Well, we'll keep them coming. Any question, we'll answer it. Tweet us at gpblog underscore com and we'll do our best. And if it's anything like this one, it's always a laugh, so... Well, guys, I think that's all we've got time for. Thank you oh, very much. It's been a pleasure to be back. I've absolutely loved it. Mm. I pleasure hope you guys have you enjoyed back it. Too, Joe. Yeah, Thank hope you. you can stick around for a while this yeah, time. Yeah, I'm back and I'm here to stay. We'll be back with the Japanese Grand Prix mm. review. Mm. Yeah. yeah, looking forward to that one. Looking Watch forward it. to that 4 a.m. start. Well, yeah, <laughs> it'll be interesting to see how many people stay up for that one. I'm not sure. 
I'll I'm be gonna up. stay up. I will, my, my wake up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. My alarm will be set at four a.m. Probably if the race starts at six. Well, catch all the action on gpblog underscore com, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Cheers.